And then next the week after, all that's is on February 23rd. And all that's will welcome Mark Askey who will speak about his time in a rock. And then our Zoom book club, or oh, bookmarks, um, it's February 28th from 7 to 8. Um, they will be reading the ground, follow them up by Scott Mingus, and then that will be followed by a presentation. You know, we're reading it yet. But <laughs> during the program, there will be a presentation by the author um, with some, will be some discussion and question and answer following. That may be full. We are looking into um, expanding the number of people who participate. So um, visit our website if you're interested in that. And, oh, there's so much to Okay, Writer's Roundtable is on March 3rd at 7 p.m. And our next second Saturday will be on March 12th, and that will be with Kim Hogan. And she will talk about the York Towns Hotel, give us a peek into the adventure of the York Towns Hotel project, the unique finds, lessons learned, and history uncovered along the way. Now, our speaker today is Rich Wagner, and he's been researching Pennsylvania brewing history since 1980. In 1990, he brewed at Pennsylvania Manor using reproductions of 17th century equipment. Two years later, he worked with a cooper to make his own system and then take it on the road to demonstrate the growing processes of antiquity at historical sites and festivals. In 1994, he earned a diploma in brewing technology from the Seidel Institute in Chicago and worked at Philadelphia, worked at Philadelphia craft breweries for over a seven year period. And since his retirement as high school science teacher, he has devoted his time to writing and speaking. He has toured the breweries in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Wilkes-Barre, Trenton, the Lehigh Valley, and South Central Pennsylvania, and published guidebooks to go with each tour. And so we will turn to Henry Mitch. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Uh, Thank you. Do I have it upside down? Now you bypass the field. Thank you for coming. Uh, what I did to begin with, can we turn the lights down? Yes. Uh, I started to figure out the oldest breweries. Everybody's heard of the Held Brewery. Everybody's heard of the York Brewery. But the brewery got started in the 1700s in York. So what I did was I arranged them on a map. So you can see the first nine here and where they were. That's your dark? That's fine. The darker the better, that makes the images. So this is the first one. And the first thing I can't understand is I think York was uh, laid out around 1740 or 44 or something like that. So we don't see a, a brewery here until 1780. And that seems a little surprising to me. Uh, although there was a lot of distilling going on in this area. This was uh, many, many more distilleries than breweries in this area. So here you can see how this brewery lasted from 1780 for about a, uh, almost a century, um, all the changes in ownership, and it ended up becoming a vinegar factory. But the Barnett's family had all, these were all Barnett's family breweries. And I've only listed them when they owned them. So many of these uh, go on under different owners. The most famous one was the Globe Brewery in York, I mean, in Baltimore. Uh, they had a big underground vault that was still part of that brewery until they built like a hundred foot silos on the property and that these vaults that were built in the 1700s weren't designed for that so they had to do something about it but they, that brewery was still in business in 1965 or 68. Uh, the other one that you may have heard of was the Fink Brewery in Harrisburg that started out as a Barnes brewery also and you can see they had a brewery in Hanover which is right down the road. So one of the sources of information I use is the United States non-resident census. Now this isn't York, but it's the Barnett's Brewery from Hanover. And it's the earliest date that I could find. So this is 1820, and it gives us a window into what was involved in a brewery, what 
you know, how many people work there and that type of thing. Facts, the uh, numbers of the dollar amounts don't really mean much um, unless you're looking at relatively speaking. You can almost figure out whether they were making money by looking at how much they got for their end product and how much they paid for their raw materials. Of course, there's a lot of other expenses as well. I rarely see women and children being employed by the brewers. And I've, I've looked at this, these, this census data for the, for the entire state. Now this is the, I saw this painting in a book, Brewed in America by Stanley Barron, published in about 1965. And this always fascinated me because <clears throat> at least in the United States, I know there's, there's drawings of breweries from Europe that go back to the middle ages probably, but you don't see much in the way of uh, brewery illustrations in the United States before uh, photography. Some line drawings and so forth, but this is really cool. This uh, Lewis Miller, I think they have an entire book devoted to his painting. And there you see John and George Barnett selling yeast. So everybody, all the women are lined up to get yeast to make their bread. And of course you see that there's a chimney back there, so any brewery is going to need a powerhouse, something to keep the boiler, boil the stuff and everything. So it doesn't show us too much about the layout, but it does give us an idea. Uh, it looks like it was made out of stone. So I, I just always love that, that painting. And this is what they were after. They, the, the cooking, they call it bar. People didn't know what it was. They just knew what it did. So one of the incarnations of that first brewery was when it became Barnett's and Brother and successors to their dad, ale and beer brewers, manufacturers of rye malt. Now that isn't their brewery, it's a brewery out in Washington, but I have it in there because that says cash for barley oil. So this is integrally tied to agricultural products, the, the ingredients for making beer. And in fact, this, this brewery went on to, to be a malt house and a brewery for many years. The second brewery was Samuel Welsh. And it was right there, half a block, I think closer to the river. And you can see here, this one started in 1817, almost 20 years after Barnett's got started. And then it had some Barnett's uh, that owned it as well. So, a great flood of 1817 washed both of those breweries away. One was brick and one was stone. And I include this picture because even though it's Lebanon or uh, Wimmelsdorf, uh, this gives us an idea of the size of a brewery. You know, this, this would go along with that uh, the painting to show you what was involved. This isn't like, you know, the Anheuser-Busch plant in St. Louis takes up 75 city blocks. You know, <laughs> it wasn't anything like that. You have to we, when we look at the past like this, we have to keep that in mind. So this just gives the whole rundown on that flood and the way that both of their breweries were washed away and they had to rebuild them. There's another successor, Kurtz and Nets, Ness Maltsters, and dealers in hops, barley, and rye malt. So let's talk a little bit about malting. Uh, there's barley in the field. You would pay the farmer to bring his barley in. And the first thing they do is they have a steep tank where they put the kernels in, soak them, drain the water off, and then spread the, spread the kernels on the floor to let them sprout. And they keep turning them all. Heat's generated. They're trying to keep uh, the aerated and they're also trying to keep them from uh, becoming a tangled mass of, of sprouts or roots. And then when, it, when the sprout gets just to the right size, then they'll take that and shovel it into a kiln. This dries the, the, dries the malt out and it arrests the germination process and it stabilizes the malt. Now the malt is dried out and, it's, and it can be stored for the next season, till the next season and so forth. But that's, that's a fairly modern malting kiln from the 1880s over there. But 
This shows the faulty process. And so depending on the temperature in the kiln, the time that you keep the malt in there will determine the grade of malt you get. So you have pale, caramel, actually some of the starches that are in the grain become converted into a caramel sugar during the kilning process. And then black patent malt, if you've destroyed the grain entirely, you're just getting a burnt flavor from that, that it'll crumble in your hand. But caramel malt, that was a big use of brewing equipment during the prohibition because you know you, you know about the, the malted milk, malted milk bar, you can use this caramel malt to make sugary things. So I think I skipped one of these guys. But anyway, this is the first one is 1887, and that's the Kurt, Kurtz and Son Malt House. And then you look in 1908, and they have four malt houses. So they've adapted one of the, they, they started out brewing, and they ended up just being in the malting business. They had quite a business in the South, from Baltimore all the way down to South Carolina. The other ingredient are hops, these cones. They start out like flowers, and that's the part of the plant that you pick. Uh, they kiln those uh, just to dry them out so they can be stored. And uh, there you can see them. They have hot poles in the fields that the, the vine grows up. Uh, and then they take those poles down and then they pick the flowers off, the cones off. So this is up at a, the other end of the town, the north end of the town on the Cadoras. Right where the, I think number three is at the, at the pitcher's mound or the home plate of the, of the baseball stadium now. So this is William Ness Sr. And I'm not sure, we don't have much information. I wasn't un, unable to find much information out about him. But the, the adjacent lot was one of the first ones. I think it was the second lot chosen when they had laying out the town and people were drawing for lots figuratively. It's, Literally. So I'm wondering if somebody didn't start this as a as a home brewery or an estate brewery. And let's just go into what I'm talking about. This is the reconstruction of William Penn's bake and brew house. You can see that's based on uh, nothing's changed since the Middle Ages or before the Middle Ages. Because there's how they laid out a bake and brew house in a convent in Germany in the 1816. Uh, this is a drawing of what a, what a brewery might, might have looked like. Of course, your heat source, the boiler there, you can see where they have firewood stacked here to, to uh, put a charge in a fuel. Then they have a, a trough there for running the wort into there to cool it off. And there you see below that is a tub of fermenting beer. And then there's a, a barrel ready to be filled when the fermentation is over. The other two photographs are from Pensbury Manor when we did our brewings there in 1990 and 91. And their boiler, they had uh, two of these copper kettles recessed into a, a boiler. They also had a little kiln off to the side where you could dry grain or hops or any, any other thing. So some of the equipment, you see the baler there, that's how we move liquids. Uh, that's the mash tun where you would take the malt that has been milled and then add hot water to it. And that's where part of the magic happens in the brewing process. You take a grain that's starchy and the enzyme that's left over after the kilning process converts that starch into sugar. So what they do is they drain the liquid from the mash and then they boil that liquid, they add hops, then they stop the boil, they cool it down, and then they put it into a fermenter and pitch the yeast. And this is what the fermentation looks like. This is maybe after two days. That's, that's my, one of my fermenters. 
And again, they were using yeast, but they didn't know if it was animal, mineral, or vegetable. And it wasn't until Louis Pasteur looked at it under the microscope that they convinced some scientists that it wasn't just a chemical reaction taking place. So this is a really cool brewery. This represents a brewery from 1840. It's up in uh, Bumsford, New York. It's, it's the Genesee uh, Village. And there's three fermenters. These hold about, I think about five barrels, maybe a barrel is 31 gallon. So then after the primary fermentation, after that big uh, head of, of uh, foam uh, dies down, they would send it down to the basement into storage barrels. And there's their, their leather pipe, <laughs> their leather hose. It's just a piece of leather that's been riveted up. The seam has been riveted. And you just wonder how they did these things, you know, with, without modern equipment that they, they interpreted that that way. So then you have the finished product. Of course, you had glass bottles, and I hope everybody will take a chance to look at uh, Mr. Mundy's, uh, I'm sorry, Mundus collection of a lot of uh, bottlers as well as brewers from the area. That's a stoneware bottle. I had made, I had a potter make me some stoneware bottles when I do my colonial brewing. I put my beer up in there and you put a cork in it and make a little basket to keep it from flying out with a piece of string. And then the picture on the right shows how, uh, how they would fill the barrel with uh, beer using that funnel, just like in that illustration. So brewing and distilling are very close, closely related. If you take what the brewer gets after the fermentation, you have maybe a four or 5% alcohol beer. Well, if you took that and distilled it, that removes the water, it concentrates the alcohol, and you end up with something that's, you know, maybe 50% alcohol or 40% alcohol. So this is from the cover of the Mercer Musée of the Bucks County uh, Magazine, Bucks County Historical Society Magazine, and that's a still house. So they were very compatible. And with brewing, uh, you stop when you get the alcohol and then you, you put it into a container. In distilling, you can use lots of other things besides grain, anything with uh, fermentable sugar in it. And they, I, I don't even, won't even attempt to go into their process, but uh, you know, then they age their things in barrels and so forth. There's an actual, I think this is pictures from the 30s, from the Indian King Tavern in uh, Hamilton. Is there any way we can get rid of that little sign there? Okay. And then this Nest Brewery, if it was started out as a home brewery, I'm not sure. It could have actually got started before Barnum. But this is the last person to have it. And it's the Gazette from uh, 1836. This uh, Remind me later. No, no, I mean, I think it's, if you can click on yeah, remind me later. The, 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 the screen is like the projector. Okay. okay. So we can't like, we will move that. Move the... I, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. So anyway, somebody rented the brewery from, from that family, and that's what he had for sale. 50 barrels of ale, 40 barrels of wheat beer, and 30 barrels of strong beer. And the strength of the beer would relate back to the recipe you're using. The more fermentable sugar, the higher the alcohol content. And this is the description of the property when it was put up for sale. The property having been expressly built for a brewery without regard to expenses. All right, now we get to Abraham Pfeiffer. Now this story, I had a great deal of help from a volunteer here, Steve Smith. Uh, he has much more, much deeper knowledge of York than I do. And he's done a lot of the uh, deed surveys and searches like that that I'm not, that I have not done. Uh, but Abraham Pfeiffer rented a tavern from Andrew Schlegel. Andrew Schlegel owned the property. And so Abraham Pfeiffer came up from Baltimore 
he got a, a license to serve beer and he had that for a couple of years. Then he got a license to brew beer. And that's when his tavern became a brewery saloon or a brewery tavern where he was actually brewing the beer on premises, just like a modern brew pub. And I took this, you'll see a picture of this with his brewery, his, his late brewery that came later, but that's probably how this, that's probably the building that is described here in the, this position for number four. It just looked like a house, three stories, had a bar room, had a meeting room and a place for people to live. But this is what ended up becoming Helps, a brewery, and we'll, we'll go into that in its own right. So Andrew Stabe purchased this from Schlegel, ran it for a few years, then Andrew Stabe got it. Here he goes. It's a fine lager beer for which this establishment enjoys an excellent reputation. He will also keep beer on draft together with other refreshments usually kept at a beer saloon or restaurant. Around the 1840s, there was a new kind of yeast that came to America, lager beer yeast. And lager beer is fermented at a cold temperature and it's aged for a time period or lagered in a cold temperature. And so this made a whole different product. And it was very popular initially as a ethnic beverage for the Germans, maybe other Europeans, but it quickly gained favor across the demographic and after the Civil War, within a decade after the Civil War, it became a national beverage and a, a favorite by, by all Americans. And so this involved refrigeration of some sort. And of course, even before lager beer, people wanted to store their ale or their beer in a cold environment to keep it from spoiling. So they had these large vaults built. And so that picture we just saw of the uh, saloon would have had vaults beneath the building. And here's some that you can actually visit at Booby's Brewery in Mount Joy. And you can see the, the type of wooden storage tanks that they would have used to, to age the beer. Well, August Wavell, Wavell, he had a similar thing. He came over here from the old country, got a saloon, got a beer selling, beer selling license, then got a brewing license. And there's a really, uh, really cool picture of him and his wife in front of their home. So there's not too many pictures of these guys out there. So that's kind of neat. That's right before he died. And then this, this is the other half of the Abraham Pfeiffer story that Steve Smith did so much research on. If you look at the, the, the modern map, this is where he moved to from the corner of number four, where, where the Hell Brewery would, would ultimately be. He was looking for a place out in the country, a place to have a beer bowl, and a place where people would come and have a beer garden in the shade of a nice atmosphere. And this was uh, one of these traditions from Germany that all these Germans brought over with them. And so Steve found the, on the 1876 Atlas, you can see where A. Pfeiffer, and he, they misspelled his name, and I doctored it up with Photoshop, but um, the, the X on the left is at Abraham Pfeiffer. You can see he's right on Tyler Run, which has been dammed up into a little pond so that you can uh, cut ice for your ice house. And there you can see ice houses, three ice houses on the other side of the pond. And there's the toll house. The other X uh, is the Baltimore, the, the toll road from Baltimore to here. So this is really cool because this also brings up the whole uh, concept of when lager beer arrived, you had to add something else to the process and that was keeping things really refrigerated. And this was the only way to do it. From my research, people didn't start cutting and storing ice until after the Revolutionary War, at least in Philadelphia. That's where most of my research is. But uh, it was after that time that people started being more concerned with their perishables and doing that. But, uh, the picture on the right shows them uh, cutting ice on the Schuylkill River, and you can see how the ice house had this long vertical opening that they would get when, as the ice would stack up, they would close it. And so when I looked at the non-resident uh, census for that, the ice house was described, the volume of ice was described by 
how many men, how many horses, and how many days it took to fill the ice house. <laughs> There's one in Reading, an entrance to a one in Reading, exactly the same as that. Abraham Pfeiffer, the guy named Felix, had a big park behind the brewery. And this was the entrance to the beer vault right in the middle of the park. So people would be set, arranged on tables. And over in Bavaria today, they still have environments like this. And they call it Keller beer, K E L L E R, because it comes right from the cellar, right from the vault. And people sit there and, and uh, in the country. And on the right, we see a beer vault that's actually on the campus of Lehigh University. That was the Rennig Brewery vault. The vault size is about 20 by 40, highest part of the roof's about 18 feet, and then it comes arched down. And then if they want to put two of them in a series, they would have the wall between them with a small opening. And in this case, there's a, a this goes back to then there's a lateral one that goes back two, and then there's a lateral one over here that goes back two. So he's got like six chambers, if you will, to store the beer there. And that one goes back. I took a flash picture in there, but there's a bunch of trash in there, so I didn't put it in the show, but that goes back also two. And they would, you know, some of these vaults were cold enough, it'd be like a cave. That would be a cave temperature. So all they had to do is they would put old tree bark from a tannery that was used as their insulated material. And they would cover the they would fill it with kegs and cover them up with that. Uh, if there was an entrance between two of those cells, they would block that up and try to keep it as cold as possible. Now we come to Spring Garden when this section of town was still in Spring Garden Township. This is another guy that wants to have some parkland, a sylvan atmosphere, and a brewery, a brewery vault, and, and his lager beer. So there is the picture. This was a Xerox uh, uh, picture on a Xerox from the brewery folder and the collection here. And there you can see Joanna and Peter Hornoff. And then it becomes John Free's Spring Garden Brewery. Uh, Free hired F.W. Ulrich is the brewmaster. So the brewmaster took it over for a while. And then, wouldn't you know it, Theodore Held bought it as a secondary location as he was building his big brewery on the, at 1 King Street. He must have, he only had this for about four years, but he must have wanted to increase his capacity for some reason. So now these are Sanborn Atlases, insurance maps. They're available online. Penn State's map drawer. If you just uh, search Pennsylvania sandboard maps. So this is when it was John Fry's brewery. You can see on the left, they have the, that would be the brew house, the mash tub and the kettle. Then you have, that's the hot side. Then the cold side is the fermenting cellar. Notice the sleeping room. Some of these guys that came with the job, you slept above the boiler or above the fermenting house. And then you have the cooper shop where they would make the pegs and then some dwellings. Brew, beer brewed at this brewery is the genuine lager, brewed only in winter from hops, barley malt, no <laughs> artificial compound being used. Summer garden and hotel. And don't forget about the sauerkraut lunch. They were big on having free lunch to get everybody out there and they have a concert in the park. So, after Pell had it for four years, his brother, J.C. Held, got it. I don't know if the year, but his, 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 his brother got it, and he turned it into his bottling works. So you can see now where the brew house had been is now bottling on the first floor, storage on the second, then storage, then there's a bar room. So the bottler would also have a saloon, storage shed, dining rooms, et cetera. And at a certain point, Julius Held became a bottler for Pabst. So Pabst in Milwaukee would ship kegs by rail to York. He would put them in his facility and they would bottle beer right from the keg. And there's a, a, a small bottling shop in, in uh, Philadelphia. Just to show you, this is, this is you need even less uh, 
real estate and less uh, infrastructure than you do to be a brewer. Well, you do see these people, they have hoses coming off the keg to fill their, their bottle. And then around the same time, a big brewery in Philadelphia had a very mechanized thing, but it was still very labor intensive. Look at how many people have to, have to work on that. But they would have this arrangement where they could get the kegs to another part of the building by taking them through the air. There. And you notice they have women working here. So this was at a certain point when the brewers did start to uh, hire boys and, and women. Now, this is from a, a lithograph from a, a Philadelphia brewer that shows a more modern, like turn of the century bottling shop. There you can see the pasteurizer on the right. And you can see that they have a system of conveyors, rollers. They have the, the bottle, bottle filler over there on the right. And then when the bottles come back from the trade, they would have these big machines that could wash them out brush them out, make sure that they were sanitized. And then on the right, you see a, um, a bottle filler. And then if we go from there, they would put a crown on it or a cap or, and then it would go to a pasteurizer. Well, in 1968, a couple of bottle collectors got into the vault down below that brewery. Down, and here's some pictures of it, which is really, which is really cool. That was fun finding this and they listed all the, the bottles that they found in there and there were of course some from york brewers but there was there was other ones too and you can see where they actually start stalactites forming there from the runoff and you can see the arrangement of the vault is just as i described it there's a door doorway to go into another vault. so august mabel took his business to a part in the country, a little bit further up north from uh, Piper, but it was Mount Vernon Park. As near as I can tell, he had the saloon in town, and then he was also running a hotel or something at this Mount Vernon Park, which was owned by the, I don't know if you call it the militia, fire company or whatever, but he, he ran a saloon there for them. And then at a certain point, he dug vaults there. At a certain point, he built his own brewery and house there. And I don't know if he rented that from an organization or whether he bought the property. I think he bought the property. Oh, yeah. Fell down and uh, broke his collarbone working on his beer ball. Just a couple of the ads. Come see the live American Eagle at Mount Vernon Park. Grand New Year's Ball. Keffer's String Band of Lancaster. And of course, the next day, the grandest that ever given in the park. Dancing was kept up until an early hour in the morning, gave entire satisfaction to all, and reluctantly, the festivities were brought to a close. Anticipated in by all, most of our ball going ladies and gentlemen who are all anxious to have a repetition of this brilliant event. Mm -hmm. So here's his obituary. Um, this is like 10 years after he got out of the brewing business. The, the anti alcohol sentiment, the, the prohibitionists were getting cranked up, and I think they were making trouble for him. And he sold the brewery in 1871, and a soap maker took it over and adapted the brewery for soap making. And then it eventually became the York Hospital. And they added on to it, and it was still standing. I think the brewery building was still standing until uh, it burned down, I believe, in the 50s. And then this is another really good source of information for me to see what. What, uh, an inventory, a uh, description of the property. Whenever the properties are going up for sale, you can really get an idea of uh, what was involved, how big was the building, you know, what was it made out of, and so forth. But all these things, they all had these vaults dug underneath or in a side of a mountain next to it. So the newcomer, 
George Erhard came from Lebanon with two other people, and he built a new modern brewery. He was going to compete with Help. And there's his uh, label for his beer. Uh, this is a new age of brewing. All the people that I've just been describing are cutting ice and have vaults and everything. And now we're talking about 1893. So this was the heyday of lager beer brewing. Um, that's his brewery. And you can see how it's very much larger and more modern than anything we've tried to show you up until now. And that's the saloon on the well, on the left. I forget the name of it. I Your Bach beer, none so pure, none so refreshing, none so wholesome. And a lot of these hotels would have their own bottling shop or shed right in the back of the hotel so that they could serve the bottled product. So there's the Sanborn. I had I put it in this direction so it would fit. But you can see all the brick area there. This would correspond to that. So if you ever wanted to pour over stuff, you know, this is this is what I do, you know, like the brew house is on the right. So the brewery, that would be what we just looked at. Then the stock house would be the refrigerated place where the stock or the beer would be stored. Dining room, kitchen, and then a bottling. Those two black uh, rectangles represent boilers, so they get two boilers. Uh, and here's a big description. It's the most modern establishment. Um, Airhorn got out of the partnership that he built the brewery with, and they sold it to uh, Mr. Katz. So Mr. Katz had been with the Reichert, Weaver, and Katz Brewery in Wilkesbarra. And so he came and purchased the brewery and he made it go up. His stock farms, like his brewery, are admirably arranged and are a credit to his business, sagacity, and executive ability. Keeps over 400 head of cattle. And there, I haven't seen very many uh, lithos or anything from these breweries, but uh, there's one that was appeared in the magazine, 1908. Okay, 1909. The beer that York will appreciate. Please bear in mind that our brewery has been renovated New machinery installed and everything connected with the manufacture of our beer has been made strictly sanitary. Our bottling department is one of the finest in the city. And this, they said this is uh, Mr. Katz from Find a Grave, but he looks awfully young. <laughs> so I was just trying to figure that out, but I threw that in there. It's got a nice sign for the York Brewery. Now, this is the modern part. York Manufacturing Company. I just looked it up yesterday. It was incorporated in 1877. That's a year after the centennial celebration in Philadelphia when refrigerating machines were exhibited. They were just coming online. This technology had finally made its way to the marketplace. And so York was in on the ground floor of that. And it was the largest refrigerating uh, company in the world. And they made refrigeration for this was a this was the dream come true for the brewers, the dairy people, people that handle produce, meats, anything that had was perishable, anything that had to keep refrigerated. Imagine this was like magic being able to turn a dial and make things cold. So there's a picture of one of their machines. And I first saw one at the Museum of Agriculture and Industry. I think they have a postcard in the gift shop. It's just, it's like a locomotive turned up on its end without wheels. It's just a phenomenal what these machines were like to 
to compress gases and, and refrigerate, make ice. First, they started making ice. The old brewers, they didn't trust it. So they packed their ice house with ice anyway, just to make sure that they were always afraid the machine wouldn't, wouldn't do what it was supposed to do. Then they started to refrigerate rooms. So there was two different things. First, making ice. And second of all, being able to just regulate the temperature of a room. And here's a picture. It's just like a, an ice cube tray on an industrial scale. There's a, you know, freezing tanks that are surrounded by refrigerant cooling that cools them down and so forth. But I'd certainly rather do it that way than stand out in the middle of the Schuylkill River and hope I don't <laughs> fall in. Now here's, you can see, this is a, a modern brewery for the 1880s. All those pipes in the ceiling are keeping that fermenting cellar cold. And there you can see, this is one of the biggest breweries in the city in Philadelphia. The open fermenters, you can see the ones that are cresting there with the foam, they're, they've been at it longer. It's a batch system. So the, the ones off to the left are newer and the ones to the right are the ones that are just about finished with the primary fermentation. After primary fermentation, they would be put into sealed storage kegs and allow some additional fermentation to take place. Uh, for lager beer, they would put some new beer in with this to create a secondary fermentation in a sealed container. And that would be how they carbonated the beer. And then these are the chip casks. You uh, all have heard of our nation's largest brewer advertising that it's beechwood aged. Well, they would put chips, they would put shavings uh, into these tanks. And then when the beer was run into the tank, everything would be all jostled up. And then when, it, when the chips settled, they would pull a lot of uh, suspended yeast particles down with them. And then they provided surfaces in the bottom for the finest particles of yeast to settle in. And this was the earliest way of clarifying beer before beer filtration became a possible. And there you can see, this is a modern layout of a brewery. You can see how the tanks that we just looked at would be on the right. That would be your stock house or your fermenting cellar. The big open fermenters, sealed fermenters, and then the chip tanks down below. You can see all the hot side on the other side. You can see the, the brewing kettles and so forth. Another big advancement was replacing those wooden tanks with steel tanks that were had a, a varnish or a, a, a glass coating on the inside. So some of you may remember a brewery out in Latrobe advertising from the glass line tanks of old Latrobe. These were the glass line tanks. And so here, this is, uh, things are getting a much more sophisticated, being able to have fittings that they couldn't do in the old days. And, a lot of other things, pressurized tanks and so forth. And this is another big advance, taking this carbon dioxide from fermentation, scrubbing it, and then re-injecting it into the beer. And most breweries today aren't big enough to do that, but they would just buy a tank of CO2 and, and inject it that way. But this was a system, this was another new technology. So there's, let's get back to hell now. This is that building that started out as a saloon on the right. And then his father bought the brewery, let the son run it for about 10 years. Then his son built this big, what was then a modern brewery in 1886. And there's Theodore. Around that same time. And then in 18, 19, 18, uh, 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 1897, I believe. Uh, Philadelphia brewery architect A.C. Wagner built this huge uh, modern brewery for help. And there's a beautiful uh, view of, the, of that corner from the collection here. And some of the workers. So we're still before prohibition. Drink 
Theodore R. Helms beer made at the Keystone Brewery. The average American spends more money for tobacco than he does for beer. Yet the latter is far healthier and cleaner and far better for the health. Tobacco is a mild stimulant, so is beer. But beer is likewise a food, building up the wheat and putting on flesh and muscle. Demand the union label. This is another issue that was coming up at the turn of that century. And there you can see all the, all the people that are on board uh, having union workers. Now, 1920 to 1933, prohibition comes into effect. People start making a cereal beverage that has no more than one half of 1% alcohol. It was not a popular beverage. Uh, but they all had funny names. So Helms had Helbo. So Mr. Help at this point was going down to Florida every winter. He liked to fish and he didn't live to see uh, the repeal of prohibition. Uh, he died in 1929. So when he died, the brewery stopped making uh, cereal beverages and they concentrated simply on ice. So that's one of the things that breweries could do during prohibition and stay legal. They could sell coal, they could sell ice, uh, they could make soft drinks, they could make cereal beverage, or they could adapt some of their cold storage space to other perishables, or some of them were used for uh, storing mink coats and things like that. So there was a lot of things they could do, uh, one of which was to make, uh, turn the wort from the brew house into a syrup, and then you would sell that to somebody, possibly with a packet of yeast on the on the container and they could make their own beer at home. The other thing that really impresses me about these people is they're, uh, so many of them were involved, like they were involved with the local banks, the local transit systems, uh, with real estate for sure, and, and also politics because they were, you know, they had a money machine in the form of a brewery so they could do whatever they wanted. You know, he was a director of the York Water Company, director of the York County National Bank for more than 25 years. So after re after repeal, when prohibition hit, the York Brewing Company, the cats a family sold the building to the York Manufacturing Company and they turned it into a uh, school and a laboratory set, uh, set uh, building. So, and the help, help wasn't making any illegal beer during Prohibition. And so now if we have 1933 and a new owner decides to build a New York brewing company. So this is an even more modern plan. And they, when you read some of the, this, uh, this is still standing. I just took this photograph in August. Um, they make much to do that. This isn't like one of these old breweries that has to be eight stories tall based on gravity. This our brewery is only two or three stories tall. And they had a whole uh, list of improvements that they had done. 50 employees, uh, New equipment installed will cost $50,000, a new filter, gas collecting tanks, new fermenting tanks, and a new pasteurizer. A reporter who toured the plant found every pipe used is of solid copper to guard the finished product from contamination. Claims, Mr. Cooper claims that he's the only brewery in America which is equipped with all copper piping. The yeast propagation tank is lined with stainless steel, and every tank in which the beer is stored is lined with glass. They have a fully equipped laboratory, etc. Just a couple more. Uh, I think it's a you know, some type of a screws or hardware manufacturer now. Where is that the remote? I have to look that one up for you. Uh, Norway Street. 
So let's go back to the picture. Yeah. Okay. So I predict Norway, what crosses it there, but, <clears throat> but out near where Shipley is. Yeah. It's across the street from a big, pretty big factory, it's like a textile mill or something. Yeah. And there's some of their post prohibition labels. Beautiful white sign. And Mr. Cooper had a brewery in Philadelphia. And so it's interesting, he made the same brands in Philadelphia. He only lasted here for a couple of years and he concentrated on the, the brewery in Philadelphia, but the labels, the only thing that's different about them is what city the beer is made in. Cooper's Old Bohemian, the labels look the same and the little family crest with the sheep, that was on both trays from both, uh, both companies. This I can't attribute a person's collection to because I got it off of Facebook and I wrote the guy's name down. I, I usually try to say who this is from, but that is just incredible. Big old sign. <laughs> Somebody just came, got from an auction. Brewed in America's most modern brewery. Like you had. 380 Norway Street. There you go. Rich, creamy Cooper beer, cool and satisfying. Enough in every bottle for all the family. They'll be glad you served. Don't ask for beer, ask for Cooper's Old Bohemian. Creamy, clear. Firm collar, it has all the brilliance and flavor of beer drawn direct from the keg. An eighth would be one eighth of a barrel, so that's a like a three and a half gallon barrel, a little picnic size pony keg. Gold cream ale. Its taste and its flavor satisfying. Its quality is always uniform and dependable. On draft, in bottles, in returnables, steinies, pints, and quarts. Make dinner a banquet with Cooper's beer. So, 38, after all that big hoopla, we're the most modern scientific brewery in America. It goes down in tubes in 38. So 30, I think it started 35, three or four years. So he packed up and went back and, and ran the brewery in Philadelphia for about 10 years uh, before that went out of business. Okay, now back to hell. The longest running, most famous, and biggest brewery in the city. So these are all uh, post-prohibition labels. You look at the one with York on the bottom left looks like the most modern, I guess. Holiday beer, I believe the ad said it was 7% alcohol, like a, a winter warmer. And there's a sign from uh, Chad Campbell's collection. Just, I don't see much from either of these two breweries when I go to brewery and conventions, but that's a really incredible sign. And here's their ad. Boom, now. Just imagine these guys being out of business for 13 years, 1920 to 33. The radio was invented. They didn't have no radio advertising before Prohibition. Shortly after Prohibition, then there's television. Like everything, so many things changed that that, that put brewers at a real disadvantage. No better beer was ever put in bottles than the famous Helms Holiday Beer. 
Mr. Adolf Hartman, our master brewer from the old school of four decades that brewed his masterpiece. Imported hops and the best ingredients obtainable. Make mine help. Ready now? Helms Pilsner. So the Helms family estate had the brewery. They started it back up after Prohibition. Uh, a nephew of Theodore's purchased the, the property and everything from the family in 1944. And then five years later, he announced his retirement. And look at the guy that buys it. The guy was running a brewery up in Will Williamsport. But look at his look at his list of uh, where he had worked. He started out at Blacks in Milwaukee and then went to Schlitz, Atlantic Company in Georgia. And then finally at the Flock Brewery in Williamsport. So he had big plans, uh, but he only had it for from like 49 to 50. So that's the one thing you when you read announcements about what's going to happen in the paper from a business, sometimes they're optimistic. So I'm much more connected with the old than the new. <laughs> I went to a couple of these new craft breweries the last time I came to the library here, but I did a rundown. What's interesting to me is that all these new craft breweries are starting out in very much the way that they started out in 1780. They're a brewery restaurant. They're a brewery saloon. They're, they make the beer on premise and they have food and it's a regular bar. So that's, that's one of the things that's neat. The other thing is that they're making it in small quantities. We saw that the Barnett's Brewery in, in uh, Hanover was only making 400 barrels a year. Well, some of these new brew pubs make 500 barrels a year. So it's very interesting that we've come full circle. Now, they have much more modern equipment and they do things a little bit differently, but um, it's just uh, very interesting that it, it took from 1935 to 85, Took a half a century to get with the brewing industry to go back before prohibition days. So, uh, whoops. What happened? I'm going back. Sorry. So, there you have in 1994 was the first year I've gone to the bottom of the top. 94 is the earliest brew pub brewery. It was a microbrewery. Uh, Wade Keach started the Whitetail Brewery in 94, lasted three years. In 96, Old York City lasted three months. 97, and this, this was like the first wave, if you will. Uh, Stouts started the first uh, microbrewery or brewery restaurant in the state in 1987. So compared to what we have today, these pioneers, they didn't have the advantage of a, of a public clamoring for craft beer. Nobody really, not nobody but serious beer aficionados were into that, you know. So uh, they had a, they had a uh, they had a tough time of it some of them. And there you can see they, they uh, lasted a couple of years. And then now this next wave, the more recent ones, here's one that's 10 years old. Where's uh, Liquid Hero? They're both, they've both been in business 10 years. Uh, I went to the Mex Italy for dinner on my way home, but that's in a shopping store center. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, that's that's the rundown for the for the modern breweries. And it's hard to keep track because they're opening up all the time. And there's my family of barrels. So I'm standing behind a one barrel, and there's a half barrel to the right and a quarter barrel to the right of that. And the other two are European hectoliters. So that's it. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, I have some copies of this magazine with an article I wrote on 
post prohibition brewing in New York. I'm selling these for two bucks, so I haven't done it. I have a few of these if anybody's interested. So, does anybody have any questions? We have one online. Uh, Adam Ben uh, asked regarding this brewery product, 1836. Any idea what difference was between ale, beer, and strong beer? This was before lager arrived in the US, right? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> what I was saying about the amount of alcohol being uh, based on how much uh, material, uh, how much grain you put in, how much fermentables you had. So a lot of times what they would do is they would run the, they would run the hot water through the mash and they would collect the first runnings and that would be a thick, heavier liquid. And then they keep running it through and get a second running that would not be as strong. And so the strong one would be fermented separately. And that would be your strong beer. It would have a higher alcohol content and it would have to age a little bit longer. The second runnings would be a small beer. That would be a lower alcohol beer. And then that would not age very long and it would be referred to as present use. So that's what the difference is. You have a low, say a three, 4% alcohol beer would be your small beer. And then your strong beer would be six, five, five to seven percent, something like that. So the strong beer and beer, of course, is sold by the quantity of alcohol. Stronger beer costs more. So the average family could afford the small beer, feed a bucket of bucket of beer for dinner, you know, send Junior down to the saloon, get a growler to go and have a bucket of beer with dinner. So that's the difference. Thank you, Adam. Anybody else? Okay, well, take a look at the Mr. Bundes bottles. He's got a, an incredible co collection, some really rare bottles there. He even has a uh, Abraham Pfeiffer bottle. Whose bottles are those? Marty. Marty. Is that your book by the bottles and jokes? Uh, yeah, that is their mine, but John Martin. Yeah, I knew him. He was my neighbor. Yeah, he's a great I grew up, isn't that? He has a son. I'm named Mike there. He has a son named there. Yeah. He's like, you're younger than I am. And uh, like he just died. He just died about, about two months ago. Yeah, he did that before I could call him up and had a few questions about his book. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <call him? laughs> <laughs> the next yeah. thing I know, I saw Yeah, I knew it was like in the 60s and 70s at the Gay area. Yeah. I don't know what's going on in the house. Like, there's going to be a sale actually. Um, I think it's going to be Tuesday. What an auction? An auction for all this stuff. So, he has another son that's younger. He's around. I'm surprised he doesn't try to I don't know. I got a lot from him before he passed away. He was, he was uh, very knowledgeable, but he kind of stumbled into it. <laughs> he actually cleaned some of the bottles. There's a way you can actually clean. I think he put like metal or something in it, like grow patties. He, no, he had, he had a machine that actually cut the glass and he cleaned them, make like brand new and Well, I used to take it to him to clean them. And he said, sometimes when I would stop over there at his age, he'd be fine. Like, one day we got out there, he had a ladder against the tree. And he cut the limbs off the tree, like up climbing the ladder. And you know, he's a pretty old fellow, and he doesn't know he stopped in. I don't want to say that one of the bottles is being blown out of work. Yeah, I walked out back. Sketchy. He had his ladder again, and he's up there high, cutting me by hand. And cutting, he, he lived off this tree. Yeah, he did a lot of carpentry work, too. Yeah, he should. I was like, Don, I don't think you should be over that high. And he's like, Oh, I'm just taking my time. He couldn't hear it too good. Yeah, he had to scream in his ear, really. He always was that. Even when I was in first 